Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel, Anatomy Mentor. Today, our topic for discussion is oogenesis, ovulation, and reproductive cycles. Now, this is a topic which is a topic of embryology. And today, we shall be discussing all the stages of oocyte maturation before birth and at the time of puberty. Also, we shall discuss the stages of follicular maturation and the relation of ovarian and endometrial cycles with follicular maturation, and in the end, also the mechanism of ovulation. We shall also be talking about the clinical conditions, which are polycystic ovarian syndrome, as well as the endometriosis. Now, starting with today's topic, first, let us define oogenesis. This is the process by which oogonia differentiate into mature oocytes. And maturation of these oocytes begins before birth, accelerates at the time of puberty, and ends at the time of menopause. Now, if you have already attended the discussion on spermatogenesis, then you can see the comparative difference right over here, that in case of the spermatogenesis, which is the sperm formation, that process is initiated at the time of puberty. But in case of oogenesis, you can see over here that before birth, the process of oogenesis starts. But of course, it halts during the time which is the childhood and then restarts at the time of puberty. So this is the difference of oogenesis from spermatogenesis, which I would like you to take note in the very first slide. Here is also a comparative chart showing us spermatogenesis on the left and oogenesis on the right. So let's look over here in the initial stages, which are the stages of mitosis, spermatogenesis and oogenesis, they have the similar mechanism in which the primordial germ cell gives rise to the clone of similar cells by the cell division process, which is mitosis. So here you can see we have lots of spermatogonia and similarly we have lots of oogonia which have been derived from the primordial germ cells. If you recall the lecture on spermatogenesis, then you would remember that the spermatogonium, when it is transformed into a primary spermatocyte, the primary spermatocyte undergoes the cell division process, which is meiosis one. And here the two haploid cells now, have been generated. So the chromosome number has been reduced to half in meiosis one. And each of this cell then gives rise to further two more cells by the cell division, which is meiosis two. So one primary spermatocyte has given rise to four spermatids, which will form four mature spermatozoa. Now, what happens in case of oogenesis? In oogenesis, the first difference you can see from spermatogenesis is the size of the primary oocyte. This is much larger in comparison to the size of the primary spermatocyte. And then the next difference you can see is that when the meiosis one takes place from the primary oocyte, there is going to be one viable secondary oocyte, but only one, whereas the next um, uh, cell would not be functional. It is just known as a polar body, which usually disintegrates. And it might or might not undergo another division. Whereas the secondary oocyte, this is the one which then gives rise to the ovum, the mature ovum after meiosis two. So one primary oocyte you can see has given rise to one viable mature ovum. And this is in contrast to spermatogenesis where one primary spermatocyte was giving rise to the four viable mature spermatozoa. Okay, now when we are talking about oogenesis, we have to remember that oogenesis is, like I told you, the series or stages of division which the uh, primordial germ cells will undergo and that includes the oogonial stage and the primary, the secondary oocyte, and eventually the mature ovum. These stages, they take place within the ovaries. And in the ovaries, to be more specific, they take place within structures which are known as follicles. Now, what are follicles? Follicles are simply the epithelium-derived cells which are surrounding the oocyte 
and uh, they are giving the protective nourishing environment for the oocy to go through these different stages of development. So here in this chart, you can see the process of oogenesis in which I told you initially mitosis takes place and we get a large number of oogonia. And then these oogonia, they will then uh, change into the primary oocytes. This means that the process of oogenesis has begun in case of females before birth. So before birth, that means during the intrauterine life, within the ovary of the uh, female, developing female, you can see the primary oocyte has appeared and meiosis one has also begun within this primary oocyte. But the important thing to know is that this meiosis one, it becomes arrested or it stops in prophase. So the oocytes, they remain arrested in prophase one. And to be more specific, it is actually the diplotene stage of prophase one in which these primary oocytes will remain arrested. And this is because of the production of a factor known as oocyte maturation inhibition peptide by the follicular cells which are surrounding this oocyte. So like I told you before, in, during childhood, uh, this process it remains arrested because the ovary is inactive. But what happens is at the time of puberty, now the hormones are going to be produced from the pituitary and under the influence of these hormones, which are FSH and LH, these ovaries are now going to become active. The oocytes, which, are, which were the primary oocytes, which were arrested in prophase one, they will also now complete their stages of cell division. Secondary oocyte will be formed uh, in that case, in that um, uh, follicle in which it is going to be ready for ovulation. And this will then form the mature ovum, that is the meiosis 2 will be completed if the sperm is present. And in that case, only then will the fertilization occur and the zygote be formed. Let's look at the different uh, stages of the follicles which are surrounding the oocytes. The follicle development starts with the initial one, which is known as the primordial follicle. Remember that the primary oocyte is present within a single layer of flattened cells. These flattened follicular cells, when they are present in the form of a single layer surrounding the primary oocyte, this is known as a primordial follicle. And this is the presence of in uh, within the ovary at the time of childhood. But like I told you at the time of puberty, when the hormones are going to appear, then under the influence of FSH, which is follicular stimulating hormone, which is coming from the pituitary gland, this primordial follicle will be converted into the primary follicle. The difference is that the flattened cells will become cuboidal cells, and then they will multiply, forming multiple layers, and eventually also a cavity filled with the liquid fluid appears with amongst these follicular cells and now it's known as the secondary follicle and it enlarges, it becomes larger. Now it's called the tertiary follicle and it, go, it is going to ovulate. It is the tertiary follicle which will release the secondary oocyte. So let's look at these stages of the follicular maturation. Let's summarize these stages. Now we're talking about the fol follicular maturation. So before birth, I told you that the during the intrauterine life, the oogonia increase rapidly in number by mitosis. Now, their number increases to an estimated maximum of 7 million in the fifth month of intrauterine life. But remember, most of these degenerate by the seventh month of intrauterine life. So eventually, in a newborn uh, baby girl, in her ovary, there would be about 600,000 to 800,000 primary oocytes. Remember, these primary oocytes are arrested in prophase of meiosis 1. And also, they are surrounded by a single layer of flattened epithelial cells, which is known as the primordial follicle. And this is the situation which remains up till the time of puberty. So here are the series of diagrams which have been drawn to represent the uh, situation in the ovaries in the different time periods fourth month of intrauterine life, that is before birth, and then seventh month of intrauterine life, and then diagram C is showing us in case the ovary in case of a newborn. 
So in A and B, which are the stages before birth, we can see within the ovary, the primary oocytes, they are present, uh, they are arrested in prophase of the first meiotic division. You can see the oogonia as well in the initial stages along with the primary oocytes. And then later on in the intrauterine life, you can see that each primary oocyte is surrounded by a single layer of these flattened cells. You can see the nucleus of these cells is flattened. And these are the follicular cells. And this structure, which we can see over here, and also in the newborn, we can see that this structure is known as the primordial follicle, right? So the important thing to remember is that no primary oocytes are formed after birth in the females. And during childhood, even uh, the primary oocytes which were produced before birth, during childhood, many of those primary oocytes, they become atretic, which means they become degenerated. Approximately 40,000 are present, therefore, at the beginning of puberty. So I just mentioned that at the time of birth, there were about 600,000 to 800,000 primary oocytes. Now you can see throughout childhood, many of those oocytes have become atretic. So eventually only about 40,000 are present at the beginning of puberty. And keep in mind, not all of these will be ovulated. Not all of them will be released by the ovary. Only less than 500 will be ovulated throughout the reproductive lifespan of a female. Now, this point is something to understand that some primary oocytes, as I told you, since all of them are not going to be ovulated, this means some primary oocytes remain dormant up to 40 years before ovulation. And this is the factor which increases the chance of meiotic errors. And this explains the association of some chromosomal abnormalities such as Down syndrome. You would have heard about that, that the Chances of occurrence of Down syndrome increases with the when the maternal age is more than 35 years. And it keeps the chance of um, the baby developing Down syndrome increases as the age of the mother goes on increasing. So this is a factor which contributes to such chromosomal abnormalities because the waiting period, you could say, or the period of dormancy of the oocyte, which would be ovulated, that increases. Anyhow... Now, like coming back to the time of puberty, when the reproductive age of a female begins, we know that it is under the influence of the follicular stimulating hormone, and uh, which is going to be produced by the pituitary gland. What this hormone does is that every month it causes 15 to 20 follicles, uh, which uh, I told you uh, in the initial stage are the prim were the primordial follicles. It causes their growth and uh, then they, they fall, pass through these stages, which are primary, secondary, and tertiary. So like I told you, the primordial follicle, it, when it becomes primary follicle, it is initially surrounded by a single layer of cuboidal cells, which then becomes a multiple layer of cells. And then this, when the cavity or spaces appear within this follicle, within the follicular cells, it is known as the secondary or antral follicle. And when the LH hormone, now this is a hormone also being produced by the pituitary, the luteinizing hormone, its levels become so high in the middle of the menstrual cycle that it stimulates one follicle to full maturity and it becomes so large in size, it is about 25 millimeters or more in diameter. That follicle is known as the tertiary or the graphene follicle, also called the pre-ovulatory follicle. This is the follicle which will be ovulated. So let's look at these uh, stages of the follicular development. Here we have the primordial follicle, which was the one which was present at, in the newborn ovary. And you can see there's a single layer of the flattened follicular epithelial cells, and they're surrounding this primary oocyte. But then I told you at the time of puberty, under the influence of follicular stimulating hormone, these flattened cells become cuboidal shaped, and there is the appearance of another layer which is over here drawn as a red line between the primary oocyte and the follicular cells. This is the extracellular material, a gelatinous layer, which is known as zona pellucida. At this stage, this is the primary follicle now. It is the unilaminar primary follicle. These follicular cells will then divide and they will form multiple layers 
of the follicular cells, which is now called stratum granulosum. This layer can now be called stratum granulosum. And at this stage of development, this primary follicle is called a multilaminar primary follicle. And surrounding this are simply the cells present within the connective tissue or the stroma of the ovary. Now come the further stages, which is the secondary follicle. I told you that between these follicular cells, that is the stratum granulosum, spaces appear. And within those spaces, the fluid appears and they all unite and they form a large cavity known as the follicular antrum. When this cavity has appeared, it is going to push the primary oocyte to one side of the follicle and this primary oocyte has now become off-center. This stage of development is known as the secondary follicle or the antral follicle. And then, like I told you, under the influence of follicular stimulating hormone, several follicles, they are growing, but only one of those follicles every month becomes so enlarged that its size is going to be 25 millimeters or more. This is because of the rapid expansion of the antrum and the primary oocyte is now just pushed to one side of this follicle. And here now this follicle is known as the tertiary or the graphene follicle. Whereas these cells of stratum granulosum, the point at which they are covering the uh, oocyte and between the antrum and the oocyte, these cells are called the cumulus oophorus. Also, I would like you to notice an important rearrangement in the stromal cells surrounding the follicle. These stromal cells have arranged themselves into two layers surrounding the follicle. The inner layer is the uh, cellular layer, which has steroid secreting cells. This is called theca interna. External to that is the theca externa, which has the cells which are more fibrous. What normally happens is that the cells of theca interna, their steroid secreting cells, they produce androstenedione, which is the hormone which is going to be transferred to the inner layer, that is to the granulosa cells. The granulosa cells are producing an enzyme aromatase, which converts the androstenedione into estradiol. So this is how estrogen production takes place by the cells of these follicles. Here again is simply a summary of the stages of follicular development. If you follow the laser pointer from above downwards, I'm going to go through these stages again. You see first is the primordial follicle, then you have the preantral, uh, you have the primary unilaminar, primary multilaminar follicle, then we have the secondary or antral follicle, and eventually we have the largest one, which is the tertiary or the graphene follicle. Now we're going to discuss the reproductive cycles. Now we all know that starting from the time of puberty, under the influence of the hormones, females undergo regular monthly reproductive or sexual cycles. And remember, these are actually two cycles. One is the ovarian cycle and the other is the endometrial cycle. The endometrial cycle is also known as the menstrual cycle. And these reproductive cycles actually involve the activity of multiple glands or organs throughout the human body, starting with the brain. In the brain, we have the area which is known as the hypothalamus. You know, hypothalamus produces the hormones, which are the gonadotrophin releasing hormone. It causes the release of gonadotrophins from the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is also a region in the brain, a gland in the brain. And over there, this is the gland producing the gonadotrophins, which are FSH and LH. And they then have their influence on the ovaries as well as the uterus. And it's not just the ovaries and the uterus which are involved in reproductive cycles. It's also the fallopian tubes. It's also the vagina and the mammary glands. The function, the ultimate function of these reproductive cycles, keep in mind, is to prepare the uterus for pregnancy. So here is the basic anatomy of the female genital tract. And we can see over here that this is the uterine cavity. This is the fundus of the uterus. Here is the body of the uterus. And this lower part is the cervix of the uterus, which leads into the vagina. Over here, we can see that at the outer edges of the uterine cavity, 
are these fallopian tubes. These are the paired tubes, also known as the uterine tubes or the oviducts. And also here you can see these two glands or organs, which are the female gonads, and these are the ovaries. So remember, the ovaries are the female gonads, which contain the follicles within which are present the oocytes going through these stages of development, which I just mentioned to you. So ovaries are the almond-shaped bodies, about three centimeters long. Each ovary is about three centimeters long, 1.5 centimeters wide, and one centimeter thick. And it has an outer part, the cortex, which contains the developing follicles, and the inner part, which has the blood vessels and supporting tissue, uh, which is known as the medulla, that contains the vascular stroma. Now let's talk about the uterus. So when we look at the uterus, when we look at the wall of the uterus, remember it has three layers, and these layers from the internal to external aspect are the endometrium, myometrium, and the perimetrium. The innermost layer, the endometrium, is the one which is the uterine mucosa, that is the epithelium and the supporting tissue. Outer to that is the muscle layer, which has smooth muscle, it is called myometrium, and the external one is the perimetrium, which is simply the visceral layer of the peritoneum, that is the serosa. And this is a single layer of the flattened cells. Okay, so we are going to look at the layers of the uterus and uh, here this point represents the lumen or the uterine cavity and then we are going on the external aspect and we can see this here portion is the uterine endometrium which has the inner part the functional layer and the outer part the basal layer so these are the subdivisions of the uterine endometrium the functional and basal layer and outer to that, this here is the myometrium. Now, first over here, I would like to focus on the blood supply of the endometrium. Remember that there are arcuate arteries present within the myometrium. These are the arcuate arteries. And from the arcuate arteries arise the radial branches which enter the endometrium. These radial branches give off further two sets of arteries within the uterine endometrium the straight arteries and the spiral arteries. The straight arteries are the ones which are entering the basal layer of the uterine endometrium. And these are branches alongside, whereas the main continuation of radial artery, this is a twisted artery, which is known as the spiral artery. And this is the one which enters the functional layer of the uterine endometrium. And it forms communication with this microvasculature. You can see with the capillaries and the venous lacunae. Lacuna literally means lake, which are filled with the blood. And also, I would like you to notice that this here is the inner uterine epithelium, which is the simple columnar epithelium. And the invagination of this epithelium produces these uterine glands. The basal portion of these uterine glands is present in the basal layer of uterine endometrium, whereas the uh, major portion of this gland, this uterine gland, is present within the functional layer. So this is the description of the layers of the uterine endometrium. Okay, so over here on this chart, we are looking at the very important um, hypothalamic pituitary gonadal uh, uterine axis. So the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal uterine axis represents the series of events which take place in a sequence under the influence of hormones. So like I told you before, the hypothalamus is the one which is producing the gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GnRH, which has its influence on the pituitary gland to secrete these gonadotrophic hormones, which are FSH and LH. FSH, in turn, as well as LH, have their influence on the follicles which are present within the female gonads, that is the ovaries. FSH, which is the follicle-stimulating hormone, it stimulates the follicles within ovaries to go through these stages of development from the 
primary, secondary to the tertiary follicle. This tertiary follicle will ovulate at uh, the mid-cycle under the influence of the levels, the peak levels of the LH, that is luteinizing hormone. The remaining cells, after releasing the oocyte, those remaining cells transform into a glandular structure within the ovary, which is known as the corpus luteum. Now, if we look at the hormones which are being produced by the ovary, these are two hormones, namely estrogen and progesterone. These are the sex hormones. Estrogen is produced by the follicular cells, whereas the progesterone is produced by the luteal cells of corpus luteum. Now, these hormones in turn have their effect on the uterine mucosa, that is the endometrial lining of the uterus. Under the influence of estrogen, the innermost lining, that is the uterine mucosa, becomes thicker, and uh, this is known as the proliferative phase. And then under, if ovulation has occurred, then under the influence of progesterone, this uterine mucosa becomes further increased in thickness and the spiral arteries, their um, uh, further coiling takes place as well as the coiling of the uterine glands and accumulation of lipids and glycogen. And this is known as the secretory phase of the uterine endometrium. So all these events, they are interlinked and they're influencing each other as a chain of events. Okay, so now we can move on. So let's summarize the functions of gonadotrophins. Gonadotrophins are the FSH and LH. We know that they are responsible for producing these cyclic changes in the ovaries, and this is known as the ovarian cycle. So the changes which are taking place within the ovaries, remember, that is known as the ovarian cycle. So what are the functions of follicle stimulating hormone? It stimulates the development of ovarian follicles, plus it also stimulates the production of estrogen by the follicular cells. And what are the functions of luteinizing hormone? It causes the primary oocyte to complete meiosis 1. This is a very important function because this is going to be linked with ovulation, that is the release of the secondary oocyte. And it also stimulates the release of both estrogen and progesterone from corpus luteum, although it's the progesterone which is now going to be produced in greater quantities. So ovarian cycle it, it's, uh, itself is consisting of these stages of development. First one is the follicular phase in which the follicles are developing within the ovaries. This is induced by FSH. And then it is followed by luteal phase, which is induced by LH. Now we're going to summarize the functions of the sex hormones, that is the estrogen and progesterone. These are the hormones which are responsible for the cyclic changes which are taking place in the uterine endometrium. And the, this constitutes the menstrual cycle or the endometrial cycle. What are the functions of estrogen? It stimulates the uterine endometrium to enter the proliferative, also known as the follicular phase. And it also causes a thinning of the mucus, which are the secretions within the cervix of the uh, uterus, that is the lower part of the uterus, to facilitate, to allow the passage of sperm. And it also stimulates the pituitary gland to release LH. At the end of the proliferative phase, the uterine endometrium is 2 to 3 millimeters thick. What are the functions of progesterone? Progesterone causes the uterine endometrium to enter the second phase, that is the luteal phase, also called secretory or progestational phase, in preparation for implantation. And at its peak, the endometrium at the end of this phase would be about four to five millimeters thick. And remember, it also causes the mucus within the cervix to thicken. This is to prevent now the entry of any further sperm. So what is menstruation? Menstruation is the breakdown of the inner lining of the uh, uterus, which occurs when there is a rapid decline of the progesterone hormone. Because if fertilization does not occur, then in that case, the corpus luteum will not be maintained 
and that will cause a decrease in the level of this hormone progesterone, which triggers a sequence of changes which are constituting constriction of these spiral arteries and other changes which cause a decreased blood supply known as ischemia within the functional layer of the uterine endometrium. So as I told you, there are two layers of uterine endometrium, that is the inner functional and outer basal layer. Well, it is the functional layer which disintegrates and it separates from the basal layer and it is discarded uh, during the menstruation. Now, what are the stages of endometrial cycle? You can see we can give it a time length of 28 days, but this is variable. Uh, but the general average time period of the menstrual cycle is 28 days. And it constitutes these four phases in a sequence, starting with the first phase is considered menstruation about approximately five days. And then comes the proliferative phase, which is about nine days. Then the secretory phase, which is 13 days approximately. And then again, the ischemic or premenstrual phase, which is about one day long. Remember, in 90% women, the length of the cycle, it ranges from 23 to 35 days. So 28 days is the average length and the range is 23 to 35 days. It is the duration of the proliferative phase, which is mostly responsible for these variations. Here is the uh, hormonal chart, which is giving us a comparative analysis of the hormonal levels during the ovarian cycle and also during the uterine cycle. Now let's look at the levels of FSH and LH uh, at the time of the follicular phase of ovarian cycle. Obviously FSH levels, which are represented by the blue line, are more in comparison to the LH levels, which are represented by the pink purplish lines. But then you can see as the LH levels elevate, this causes the ovulation. And after that, in the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle, the LH levels, they remain higher in comparison to the um, FSH levels. What about the sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone? Well, estrogen levels are higher during ovarian cycle as follicular cells are producing estrogen, which is represented by the red line. And then it becomes lower in the luteal phase. And in luteal phase, the progesterone levels will now increase, which are represented by the purple bluish line. And also you can see that these are the phases in the uh, endometrium of the uterus. And the first I told you phase is the menstrual phase in which there is a breakdown of the tissue lining. Then comes the reconstruction. There is a regeneration of the basal layer of uh, from the basal layer of the uh, uterine endometrium. There is a regeneration of the functional layer and that is constituting the proliferative phase. And after ovulation, then the inner uterine lining becomes more thicker. It is now constituting the secretory phase. It also becomes uh, more spongy and uh, uh, filled with, like I told you, lipid and glycogen and the spiral arteries, they become coiled. This is the secretory phase. The secretory glands, they also become coiled and this is known as the secretory phase of the menstrual cycle. And you can see throughout this phase, the progesterone levels are higher. This is a very simple um, way to explain the um, relation of these cycles with one another. Remember that the endometrium is a mirror of the ovarian cycle because it responds to it in a consistent manner to the fluctuating concentrations of gonadotropic and ovarian hormones. So whatever changes are taking place in the endometrium of the uterus, they are a reflection of the events which are taking place within the ovaries. Now we're going to focus on ovulation. We're going to talk about this process. It occurs midway, that is in the middle part of the menstrual cycle. And specifically remember, it is the 14th day of a typical 28 day cycle. 14th day is the day when ovulation will occur. Now what happens just before ovulation is that the surface of the ovary bulges. This bulge is produced by, I told you, one of the follicles is going to increase massively in size. 
and uh, it is going to be about 25 millimeters or more in size. It is called the tertiary follicle. This is the follicle which is going to ovulate and it produces a bulge or a stretching of the surface of the ovary, producing an avascular spot, a whitish area at the apex, which is known as the stigma. This marks the site of ovulation. And remember, it is the secondary oocyte which is going to be released because under the influence of LH, the, uh, the primary oocyte is going to be converted into secondary oocyte and it is the secondary oocyte which will be released in ovulation. But remember, as meiosis 2 begins in secondary oocyte, this meiosis 2 also becomes arrested. It becomes arrested in the metaphase just about three hours before ovulation. Now, uh, what are the factors? There are many factors which cause ovulation. Multiple factors are involved. There's an enzyme known as collagenase, which breaks down the collagen. That is the tissue which is forming the supporting tissue, the stromal area of the ovary. Also, the prostaglandins are the substances which stimulate contraction of smooth muscle in the theca externa. That is the outermost layer of the follicle, as well as in the ovarian wall. The granulosa cells themselves secrete hyaluronic acid, which loosens the cells. So here are the cyclic changes which are occurring during an ovarian cycle. Uh, we can see in a very simple diagram, they have shown us the stages, which are the follicular stages of development. We have the primordial follicles, and they're the increasing in size under the influence of FSH. They become primary, secondary follicles. Now, one follicle every month becomes this tertiary or graphene follicle. And you can see the primary uh, oocyte over here is uh, now going to be converted into the secondary oocyte because this is the one which is, this is the follicle which is ovulating. So the ovulated uh, oocyte is actually the secondary oocyte, keep it in mind. It is surrounded by a few cells, a few follicular cells, which are now forming the corona radiata around this oocyte. Those cells of the theca interna and the granulosa cells which are remaining, they will form the corpus luteum. And this is a glandular structure. If fertilization doesn't occur, this corpus luteum will degenerate, forming the whitish scar-like tissue known as the corpus albicans. So all of these changes are occurring in the um, cortical region of the ovary, whereas this medullary region contains the blood vessels. So let's look at uh, ovulation a little closer. We can see over here, this is the tertiary follicle. Here you can see the oocyte, it is off center. And uh, these are the layers which are granulosa cells surrounded by theca interna and externa. Like I told you, this produces a bulge on the surface of the ovary, which is known as the stigma. This is the point where the oocyte is released and it is now surrounded by these follicular cells. And uh, over here, this is the oocyte, which is the secondary oocyte. And now second meiotic division has started in the secondary oocyte, but has again become arrested during metaphase. And over here, the remaining cells of theca interna, and you can see the uh, granulosa, theca interna and granulosa cells, they are going to accumulate lipid and they are also going to accumulate a yellowish pigment known as luteum, and they have become these luteal cells. So this is now known as the corpus luteum, the center of which is filled up with fibrin. And this is going to secrete the hormone, which is progesterone. These were the pictures which were taken at the time of laparoscopy, and they are showing you the ovulation which is taking place and here you can see if this is this is the surface of the ovary and here is the follicle which is ovulating and it is releasing the ovum over here. You can see this is the ovum which is being released at the time of ovulation. And remember a mature ovum is about one millimeter in size so it can be seen with the naked eye. What happens when the oocyte is released? Well, it is going to be taken up by the uterine tube, by the movements of the fimbria, which are the finger-like extensions from the distal end of the uterine tube. And also there is movement of cilia, which are the extensions, apical extensions of the cells, which are lining the internal aspect of the uterine tube. 
plus there is contraction of the muscular tissue, the smooth muscle within the uterine tube. All of these events facilitate the movement of the oocyte from the distal to the proximal aspect, that is towards the uterine cavity. So let's look at over here the events which follow ovulation. Here is the ovary. The ovary has released the oocyte. And remember, this is the secondary oocyte. This is, I'm mentioning this again and again because this is a point which has to be clear in your mind that this is the secondary oocyte. And only if the sperm is present will this secondary oocyte complete its meiosis too and become a mature ovum. The mature ovum, it unites with the sperm to form the zygote. And the zygote, you know, is the beginning of the human being. Here, these are the fimbria of the fallopian tube, which have taken up the oocyte. And this oocyte, now we are considering that the sperm has arrived, the sperm is present, they have united to form the zygote. The zygote is now going to move proximally towards the uterine cavity. The zygote itself is undergoing different uh, changes. The zygote is undergoing uh, the process which is known as cleavage. Cleavage is a process in which it divides into a number of cells which are smaller in size. And this ball of cells known as the morula will enter this uterine cavity. Within this ball of cells, another cavity will appear which is known as the blastocele. At this point, it's called the blastocyst. The blastocyst will then implant itself into the uterine mucosa. And this implantation occurs on the sixth day after fertilization. And as you know, further changes within this uh, blastocyst will cause the further development of the embryo and the fetus, which is now going to take place within the uterine lining. Coming back to our uh, ovarian cycle, we are talking about the corpus luteum. After ovulation, when the corpus luteum is formed, I told you it consists of those theca internal granulosa cells which have transformed into luteal cells. They have acquired a yellowish pigment and they're now secreting estrogen and mainly progesterone. So over here, if the fertilization does not occur, this corpus luteum, which was established during the luteal phase, will then, this uh, it will, um, you could say, uh, become non-functional, it will become atretic and form this here corpus albicans. But if fertilization does take place, if pregnancy has occurred, in that case, this corpus luteum does not dis disappear or dissolve. It in fact becomes maintained as the structure which is known as the corpus luteum of pregnancy or corpus luteum gravidarum. Corpus luteum gravidarum, remember, is going to be maintained by the hormone, which is HCG, human chorionic gonadotrophin, which is going to be released by the trophoblast cells, which were surrounding the uh, blastocyst. And this uh, gravidarum corpus luteum produces progesterone, and it is going to be present till the fourth month of pregnancy. From the fourth month onwards, it will then uh, become non-functional. At that point onwards, the hormone production is now possible by the placenta itself and corpus luteum is no longer needed for the hormone production. So this uh, concludes with the basic, um, um, you could see the embryology that we were talking about, the basic discussion of, of the reproductive cycles and uh, related to that, obviously now what you have to keep in mind this MCQ, what would be the answer to this one? What is the average life of the ovum? That means how long is it viable after ovulation? Keep in mind the time period is 24 hours. That is the viability of the ovum after ovulation, which means if within 24 hours after ovulation, the sperm is present, it can be fertilized and the zygote can be formed. After that, it becomes non-viable. Now, you know, we just talked about this, the primary oocyte, you know, they're going to be present in the ovary of a newborn baby girl. They are going to be surrounded by which follicle at that stage of development? It is the earliest one known as the primordial follicle in which the oocyte, primary oocyte is surrounded by a single layer of flattened follicular cells. So B is the answer for this MCQ.
Okay, uh, some terminologies, let's talk about, uh, which are associated with our discussion. What is Mittelschmerz? Mittelschmerz is a German word meaning middle pain. This describes a phenomenon which can occur at the time of ovulation. Some women might experience a pain in the lower abdomen. This is related to bleeding uh, during ovulation, a slight bleeding, which can occur into the uh, um, peritoneal cavity from the ovary. And that produces a pain in the middle of the menstrual cycle. That's why it's called middle schmerz, which literally means middle pain. And uh, this ovulation, it can be associated with the rise it, of the basal body temperature. And uh, this uh, rise of basal body temperature at the time of ovulation is just about 1.5, uh, in fact, it is 0.5 to 1 degree centigrade, not more than that. And uh, this is a primary uh, indicator of the uh, pregnancy uh, that for couples who are preventing pregnancy or if they are planning pregnancy, they can use different indicators. And one of those indicators is the change in the basal body temperature. Uh, the middle schmerz can also be an indicator, but that's not so significant. It's a secondary indicator, a better indicator would be the change in the basal body temperature. So this is known as the calendar method, which can be uh, used to determine um, um, the time period, which is the most fertile for pregnancy. So remember that there is a slight rise in the basal body temperature after ovulation during the luteal phase, that is the progestational phase of the ovarian cycle. And these are the changes in basal body temperature associated with the cycles. Clinical uh, aspect which you should be familiar with is the anovulation. Now, what is anovulation? We talked about the normal development of the uh, follicles, the follicle maturation. We talked about the uh, we talked about oogenesis. Uh, we also discussed the reproductive cycles. Now, what is anovulation? Some women they do not ovulate, and uh, this could be because of an inadequate release of the gonadotrophins. Now, this uh, ovulation, if um, it is not occurring, then of course, this could be a hindrance to pregnancy and it also causes, it can cause irregular cycles. So in these women, ovulation can be induced by giving them gonadotrophins or giving them drugs which stimulate the release of gonadotrophins such as clomiphene citrate. So this Although treatment has its own side effect, it can cause maturation of the multiple ovarian follicles and therefore multiple ovulations. And this in turn can cause multiple pregnancy when such drugs are given. When we're talking about anovulatory menstrual cycles, we have to understand that the ovary is not producing a mature follicle in such cycles. And because a mature follicle is not produced, ovulation doesn't occur. In anovulatory cycles, what happens to the uterine endometrium? Well, if you remember, I told you that the endometrial tissue is a mirror of the ovarian tissue. So if there is anovulation, it is going to affect the endometrial tissue as well. The proliferative phase is not uh, so much affected. The proliferative phase uh, develops as usual. But because ovulation doesn't occur, the corpus luteum will not be formed and this causes therefore the luteal phase of the endometrium to be insufficient. And the endometrium remains in the proliferative phase and menstruation occurs just after the proliferative phase. The progestational phase of endometrium is now absent. So these anovulatory cycles, they result from ovarian hypofunction. Also keep in mind that the birth control pills, which are containing estrogen with or without the progesterone or the progesterone analog that is progestin that is present in these pills, the, the, their mechanism of action is to be understood, which you should be familiar with. When we talk about estrogen being used as a birth control pill, remember its mechanism of action is that it's going to act on both hypothalamus and pituitary gland, causing an inhibition in the release of GnRH, FSH, and LH, and in turn, an inhibition of ovulation. So this is how it prevents ovulation, and this is how it prevents 
pregnancy. And uh, whereas when we talk about progestin, it causes a thickening of the lining of the uterus and it also causes a thickening of the cervical mucus and therefore it prevents pregnancy in that way. And uh, these pills, they can be taken orally. They all can also be administered using dermal implants or injections or skin patches, right? Now we're going to discuss the clinical condition, which is PCOS. You might have heard of this before. PCOS is now fairly common and uh, it is, stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. So this is a, the clinical condition which is related to the uh, malfunctioning of the ovaries. So in PCOS, there are bilaterally enlarged ovaries with numerous follicular cysts. So there are cysts derived from the follicles which are present within the ovaries and the follicles their normal stages of maturation are going to be affected. When it is associated with oligomenorrhea and scanty menstruation, that is decreased menstruation, decreased bleeding, which normally should have occurred associated with the menstrual cycle, then it is known as the Steen-Leventhal syndrome. Okay, so here let's look at the polycystic ovarian syndrome. And we can compare it with the normal ovary. As I showed you before, in the normal ovary, these are the follicles going through these stages of development from the primordial, primary, secondary to the tertiary or mature follicle, which will ovulate and remaining tissue will form corpus luteum. And if pregnancy doesn't occur, it becomes corpus albicans. Now we're going to compare it to the polycystic ovary. What happens in this case is that the follicles do not go through the normal stages of maturation. In, uh, instead of that, lots of immature follicles are found and they have then accumulated fluid and they have become enlarged and they have formed the cysts, right? So the ovaries, their appearance in the PCOS is uh, like they are known as the oyster ovaries because they're pearly white and the surface is smooth. The surface of the ovary is smooth because ovulations have not taken place. So there is no scarring on the surface. And these are known as the oyster ovaries. And sometimes what can happen is that bleeding might also occur within a follicular cyst and that can form the uh, hemorrhagic cysts. What is the cause of uh, PCOS? Well, the etiology exactly is not yet clear. There uh, are multiple factors which might be involved in the occurrence of PCOS. Like I told you, there has been a rise in PCOS, the cases of PCOS more recently. The uh, One of the important factors in PCOS is that there is a hormonal imbalance. There is an increased production of androgens. And these androgens, they get converted uh, into estrogen and uh, under the influence of that, although I told you before, this is going to cause an imbalance within the ovaries and this in turn is going to um, impede ovulation. So the cycles, they are going to be anovulatory. And if ovulation doesn't occur, the corpus luteum will not develop and the progestational inhibition will take place and this causes the PCOS. But like I told you, the cause is still uh, not yet identified as a single cause. There are multiple factors. There is a familial factor of familial inheritance. If, if a woman has a family history, if there are other women in the family who have had PCOS, then that increases the likelihood that she would also have PCOS, plus the lifestyle, which is a sedentary lifestyle, lifestyle lacking in physical exercise, and unhealthy eating habits. These are also different factors which contribute to the progression of polycystic ovarian syndrome. So let's look over here at what could be the symptoms of PCOS. There is a lot of variation in the clinical signs and symptoms of PCOS. A few of them which you should keep in mind are the excessive hair growth on the body, which is known as hirsutism when there's hair growth on the face. This is due to the increased level of androgens. And like I told you, uh, obesity is another factor which is associated with the PCOS. There are cysts in the ovaries and they are going to disturb the menstrual cycles. There will be irregular um, periods. And also you can see 
that the insulin resistance can be there. Acne is another factor which is seen in PCOS. That is the uh, skin is being going to be affected. There are also signs on, of depression in patients of PCOS. And eventually a complication of PCOS is the infertility that women with PCOS have trouble getting pregnant. So how would you diagnose PCOS? The pelvic examination for the uh, cyst in the ovary can, can take place. Also the blood tests which will uh, indicate the abnormal hormone levels can be done. And uh, also the ultrasound, which can detect the cysts, can be performed. The treatment, well, like I told you, because there is a hormonal imbalance, so the treatment is first you consider the hormonal treatment with the combination birth control pills, which can be given for PCOS. And uh, also, other than that, the lifestyle changes. The lifestyle changes, like I told you, exercise is important, a healthy diet is important. All of these play their role in improving the uh, condition, which is uh, the signs and symptoms of PCOS. And only if uh, there is a hemorrhagic cyst, or in that case, surgical intervention might be uh, necessary. What is the difference now between PCOS and PCOD? Well, you see, PCOS is the condition which I've just described to you, that is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And PCOD is different from PCOS. This is polycystic ovarian disease. Well, keep this in mind that the PCOS is the more serious and the long-term metabolic disorder, whereas PCOD, polycystic ovarian disease, is a, a temporary and uh, it is a milder form uh, of hormonal imbalance. So PCOD might be uh, controlled or treated only with the lifestyle changes. Now we are going to discuss the clinical condition, which is endometriosis. What is endometriosis? Well, endometriosis is the condition in which the tissue, which is similar to the endometrial tissue, is present in a location outside of the uterine cavity. This endometrial tissue might be present in the ovaries. It might be present in the fallopian tubes. It might be present in the outer aspect of the uterus or anywhere in the pelvic cavity close to the pelvic viscera. Now, what happens is that this endometrial tissue, it also thickens and bleeds in response to the cyclic changes during the menstrual cycle. And when this occurs, this leads to dysmenorrhea, that is the painful uterine abdominal cramps associated with menstruation. And it can also cause dyspareunia, which is pain during coitus. And it can also cause menorrhagia, which is the abnormally heavy bleeding, a bleeding which might last for more than seven days. So this endometriosis is a condition which uh, can be very painful and it needs to be treated. It is also treated medically by giving hormones and in some cases, surgery might also be necessary. When the endometrial tissue is present in the ovaries, in the later stages, it can cause the formation of endometriomas. It can also cause the formation of the chocolate cysts which are cysts in the ovaries filled with the dark colored fluid and surgical intervention might be necessary. Okay, so this concludes with today's topic in which I have discussed oogenesis and follicular maturation and the reproductive cycles with you. And uh, I uh, hope you uh, got a better concept of these events and an association of these events with each other. So, if you found this lecture, if you found this presentation helpful and interesting, then please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is Anatomy Mentor. You can do that by simply pressing on or clicking on my picture, which is going to appear at the end of this video. And uh, be sure to also press the bell icon so you can be notified of my video updates, any new presentations or lectures that I upload. So thank you for your time and stay blessed and enjoy studying and go through this topic also through your textbooks. And then when you can, when you listen to this video, I'm sure you have a better understanding of this topic.
Take care and goodbye.